Welcome to Rocky DU. Um, as you guys know, we're Rockefeller, or you may not know, we're actually Rockefeller University Science Outreach Program. We have a, slew, a list of programming here that we offer for the K-12 community alongside teachers and educators and scientists alike. Um, we have, how many of you guys have been here for lab experiences? Ooh, okay, so it's like a full circle. How many of y'all have been involved in any of our research programs? So our Lab Jumpstart, our SSRP. Okay, a couple hands, awesome. And so we have a number of different programs. That all of them are free to the K-12 community and for teachers, so we're always encouraging um, science and encouraging people becoming involved in the scientific process and understanding what that's like and promoting equitable access to all of them. Um, and myself, I forgot to introduce myself the last time, so I'm Odella Swallow, and I'm actually the scientist educator. And sitting in front here is a couple of my team members. We have Jeannie, our director, Desan, our program manager, our communications coordinator, Nader, Nika in the back, and Doug, who's our administrator, still checking in awesome kids that's coming in tonight. Um, and so, before I introduce the speaker, I just want to ask everyone to open your bag of chips right now, so that we don't have crinkling later in the talk. Um, and so I want to make sure that everyone's paying attention, getting some great advice. Uh, from our speaker today, um, just to be sure to hold all your conversations till after the talk, uh, where we'll have our question and answer um, segment where you can ask anything about the slide, about our speaker, um, you know, reasonable questions. And so I'll introduce our speaker. So today we have Katie Davis. She's a clinical psychologist, and today she'll be presenting her research that she did um, in a fellowship at John Hopkins. And so not at Hopkins. <laughs> Oh, she's at Hopkins now. <laughs> her thesis, sorry, her research is at Columbia. Um, so she has a private practice here in NYC. She also lives in New York City. And one fun fact about Katie is that she's never tried ketchup. <laughs> so you can talk to her about that after <laughs> after the presentation. In front, there are like 10 seats here. Um, and those who are sitting in the other seats, if you guys can move down so that those coming in can fill into the sides, that would be great. All right, so join me in welcoming Kate. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to tell you about my work. Um, so just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about today, first um, I'm going to tell you a bit about myself and my career and how I got here. Um, then I'm going to give you some background information that you need to know to really understand the research that I'll eventually tell you about. First I'm going to give you an introduction to statistics and we'll talk about a couple of the models that I used in my study. Um, then I'll give you some background information about fMRI research in general um, and some different modalities of fMRI research that are commonly used. Um, and then I'll give you some background about just basic neuroanatomy and I'll teach you a little bit about the brain structures that I'll be talking about um, that make up an emotion regulation circuit in your brain. Um, and then I'll finally get to my research and I'll tell you a bit about my study on the relationship between learning and reading and anxiety. Um, and then I'll, we'll talk about the implications of my research and what does this mean for you as high schoolers um, and what can you do to reduce anxiety and to improve your learning. Um, and then we'll talk. Um, okay, so this is something that my, one of my professors did when I was in graduate school for clinical psychology, for clinical psychology, um, before he began his lecture, he took a minute to make sure everybody was okay. So it's been a long week. Um, we're almost at the end of the school year, so this is a particularly stressful time for everybody. So let's just take a second to be at the beach. 
<laughs> take a mental vacation, take a few deep breaths, um, and get our headphones straight. Now we can move on. Um, so just to tell you a bit about myself and how I got here, in case anybody's interested in neuroscience or psychology and wants to maybe pursue a career similar to mine. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I went to public high school, and I was immediately interested in science, like beginning in ninth grade, um, especially chemistry and physics. Um, I was really into Science Olympiad and like all the really super dorky stuff, which I think is great. <laughs> um, and I also had tutoring jobs as a high schooler, and I became really interested in how people learn. Um, and I really wondered, why do some people learn better than other people? Why do some people study better than other people? And why do some people just like school and other people don't? Um, so when I went to college, I went to Brown, and I was an education major. Um, and I studied mostly human development um, and neuroscience and clinical psychology, like just intro to those fields. Um, and I started to develop like some knowledge of learning systems. Um, and especially as they intersect with special education and education policy. Um, and I had a bunch of summer jobs. I was really interested at the time in learning disabilities. So I had some summer jobs at the NYU Child Study Center, and there's a school on the Upper West Side called West End Day School. Um, I don't know if anybody goes there or knows it, but um, it's a wonderful school. And I worked with kids that had some learning difficulties. Um, and that inspired me to go to graduate school for clinical psychology. Um, eventually I thought I would be, originally I thought I would be a school psychologist. So I went to a combined school and clinical program at Yeshiva University in the Bronx. Um, and there I was exposed to neuropsychology, which is um, the relationship between brain functioning and behavior. So I was really interested in the intersections between neuropsychology and education and learning. Um, and I, was first exposed to research. So then I pursued a postdoc fellowship at Columbia, which is where I did the study that I'll talk about today. Um, I did my fellowship with something called the Promise Program, which is a wonderful program that supports kids with reading disorders. So I did a lot of neural imaging on learning disorders. I did reading disorder and um, related disabilities. And today, I kind of split my time I do clinical work right around here, actually, and I see kids with learning and attention disorders, and we work on strategies to improve learning. And I do research at Johns Hopkins. They have a lab in Midtown, and I study interventions for adults with autism. So I'm happy to talk about all of that later. Here. Um, so before we begin, I want to give you some background knowledge that you'll really need to have. And actually, before I do that, the first thing I'm going to teach is an introduction to some statistical models that are relevant for today. But in general, I just want to digress for a moment and give a little soapbox speech about how I think you all should take statistics if given the opportunity in high school. Um, I actually think statistics is one of the most important things for people to know, scientists and non-scientists alike. I found that since I have learned about statistics, I'm a much more informed consumer of not only just research, but journalism and other information that I'm exposed to. I have a lot of kids that are really anxious about the SATs. I don't know if any of you are kind of there yet. Um, the standardized test scores and how the scores translate to percentiles and what are the odds of getting a better score the next time around and what does your score actually mean relative to the rest of the population. This is all information that if you knew statistics would really deepen your understanding of even information so like relevant to life as that. So if you get the chance, for sure study statistics. So anyway, today I'll give you a brief overview of two models. The first is called correlation. And you've probably used correlation before. Um, so correlation just discusses the association or the relationship between two variables. As one variable moves, the other variable moves. So, uh, so we call them the independent variable and the dependent variable. I'm assuming that most of you know this. Independent variable x-axis, dependent variable y-axis. Mm -hmm. So independent variable is the one that typically we manipulate in studies. 
So as we manipulate the independent variable and it changes, we see the dependent variable change as well. Um, sometimes as the independent variable increases, the dependent variable also increases. Sometimes as one increases, the other decreases. Um, however, the important thing that you should know about correlation is it doesn't mean causation. A change in the independent variable does not necessarily cause a change in the dependent variable. And a really good example that I like to use to explain the difference between correlation and causation is plotted on my slide. So I don't know if you know this, but the number of ice cream sales is directly correlated with the number of drownings in a given year. Um, and at specific times of year. So as ice cream scales go up, so do the number of drownings. It's not because when you eat a lot of ice cream, you get fat and you can't swim as well. Um, instead, there's something called a confounding variable. It's another variable that's kind of floating around the equation. In this case, it's that they both happen in summertime. So ice cream sales go up in the summer, drownings go up in the summer. We see the two variables moving together, but one does not cause the other. So is everybody understanding the difference? Okay, great. And feel free, if I'm explaining something and you guys are totally lost, feel free to just shoot up a hand and let me know. I'm happy to slow down and take questions as I'm talking. Um, so correlation doesn't imply causation, but sometimes it is really helpful to come up with a statistical model that can better show causation to kind of prove a conclusion in a study. Um, the one that I use, actually the only one I I'm fairly fluent with at this point, is called mediation. So mediation is a statistical model that involves three variables. So we have the independent variable, the dependent variable, which we discussed earlier, and then a third variable called the mediator. And the mediator explains the relationship between the two other variables. Um, so for the purpose of this example, I want to just discuss the relationship between grades and happiness. So we can see an association between, between grades and happiness. As your grades go up, your happiness probably goes up as well. So there's a correlation. However, you can't necessarily say that an increase in your grades directly causes an increase in your happiness. Instead, one might suppose that self-esteem is also in the mix here. So we can test. As your grades go up, your self-esteem goes up, and then your happiness increases. So self-esteem may explain the relationship between grades and happiness. So how do we know that? We need to first see the initial relationship between grades and happiness. We need to see that correlation there. Um, we need to see a relationship between grades and self-esteem, and we need to see a relationship between self-esteem and happiness. And then when we dump all three variables in the mathematical model, we can see that the relationship between grades and self-esteem is preserved, as is the relationship between self-esteem and happiness, but this initial relationship, the initial correlation, might actually go away, either partially or completely, when we count, account for self-esteem changes. Um, if we have all of those conditions satisfied, and if we see changes in these variables happening in a temporal sequence in time order, then we can say that we have a mediati mediation model, and we can say that there probably are causal relationships going on here. So grades cause the, cause the increase in self-esteem, self-esteem cause the increase in happiness. Um, so that's gonna conclude my 30 second lecture on statistics. Is everybody good so far? Okay, great. So now that you learned a bit about stats, I wanna talk a bit about just general fMRI research. Um, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with MRIs in general. Some of you may actually have had them. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, MRIs are basically like a big machine, it's like usually a big tube, and you go inside and you hear a bunch of banging around, and magnetic fields produce a detailed image of a part of your body. Um, typically, especially in clinical settings, we're dealing with structural MRIs. They're just static images of, in my case, the brain. So you would just see a picture of the brain, different structures. Um, my research that I'm gonna to discuss today was more interested in the functioning of your brain and brain activity. Um, 
In that case, you need to use something called functional fMRI, functional MRI, fMRI um, which actually is an image of the brain overlaid with images of brain activity. So fMRI actually measures changes in blood flow to different areas of your brain. And the assumption is that blood flow is an indicator of neuronal activation. So a neuron is a cell in your brain. And we think that when an area, or when like a clump of those cells is in use, or it's activated, blood flow to that area increases. Um, so we produce images like this, and the highlighted areas are where we do see an increase in blood flow to that area of the brain, and we can say that area of the brain was activated. Um, there are two major fMRI paradigms, or um, experimental models that are common these days. The first, which I think is more traditional, which if you've heard of fMRI before, you've probably heard of this, is called task-based fMRI. And basically what happens is you go into the machine, you go into the MRI machine, and you do a task while you're in the machine, and then you don't do the task, you just kind of lie there. Um, and you contrast images of your brain when you're doing the task versus images when you're not doing the task. And the change in activation between those two conditions indicates the parts of your brain that were needed to do the task itself. Another paradigm is called resting state. Um, and resting state, basically, you go into the machine and you lie there and you daydream. And it just takes images of blood flow in the brain. And what we can learn from resting state MRI is a bit about functional connectivity. So what we think happens is if blood flow increases to two parts of the brain simultaneously a lot of the time, we think that those brains are connected into a network. Um, so the two areas of the brain that I'm going to talk about today in terms of the network that we have been looking at um, are the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. Um, the amygdala is this little blue area, which is like kind of deep in the center of your brain. And that's the emotional processing center of your brain. The other area in purple, right over here, is called the prefrontal cortex. The slide actually is more specific and labels it medial prefrontal cortex, which is more accurate. But for the purposes of today, we could just call it PFC. It's kind of in the front of your brain. And it's the part of your brain that is in charge of self-regulation. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of the term executive functioning, but the prefrontal cortex is responsible for that. It's sort of the control center. So um, in resting state fMRI, we see that um, there's an inverse relationship between these two regions. As the PFC becomes more activated, the amygdala becomes less activated. So as blood flow increases to prefrontal cortices, blood flow decreases to amygdala. And what we think is happening here is that they're involved in an emotion regulation network or circuit, and the prefrontal cort cortex is sort of shutting off or regulating the emotions that are processed in the amygdala. Does that make sense so far? Okay, great. So now I think that you have enough background knowledge on statistics and fMRI research and neuroanatomy to understand um, the study that I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, as I said before, I'm fellowship. I was involved in the Promise Project Research Study, which was a big neuroimaging study of reading disorder. For this part of that study, we recruited 43 participants total. 22 of them had reading disorder, and 21 did not have reading disorder, and we call them typically developing peers. They were all children, ages 7 to 12. Um, monolingual, monolingual English speakers, um, and in order, so we wanted to make sure that the reading disorder group and the typically developing group were matched for a number of demogra demographic variables, such as age, gender, handedness, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Um, and the reason for matching the groups on those variables is if we could say then more confidently that if we saw a difference between the groups, it was probably due to the reading disorder and not one of these other variables that could have gotten in the way. Um, we gave everybody a complete neuropsychological battery. I don't know if any of you have done neuropsych testing or know anything about neuropsych testing, but basically what that means 
because you do a bunch of paper and pencil tasks that are supposed to test different skills. And those skills each map to a different part of the brain. So we can see what's the cognitive profile and which areas of the brain do we think are implicated in strengths of that student and which areas of the brain are implicated in weaknesses. Part of the neuropsych battery was testing academic skills, especially reading, because this was a study on reading disorder. The test that was most relevant to the study that I'm going to tell you about is called the GORT. It's the Gray Oral Reading Test. And what the kids did was they had a passage that was on paper and they read it out loud. We timed them and we marked how many words they got wrong when they read out loud. And then once they were done, they put the passage away and they just needed to answer some comprehension questions. So what the test measures is something called oral reading fluency. And reading fluency is sort of a combination between reading rate and reading accuracy. So we could see if they were fast and accurate readers, they had good reading fluency. If they were slow and inaccurate readers, we said they had poor reading fluency. Um, we also gave them questionnaires to assess their emotional functioning. So it was just a huge list of questions that asked them about how they felt, and they rated their emotions, and we scored it. All of the kids also did a big MRI scan, some structural, some functional, some task-based, some resting state. Um, for this study that I'm going to tell you about, we only used the resting state data. The first thing that we noticed about the kids that participated was that there was a real behavioral connection between anxiety and reading. So based on the neuropsych scores alone, we saw across the whole sample, not just reading disorder, but reading disorder and typically developing, kids that had the most anxiety had the poorest reading fluency. So those two variables were correlated. Um, we also noticed that there was a difference in emotion regulation circuitry between those two groups, between the reading disorder group and the typically developing group. And if you could think back to a few slides ago, what I told you was that normally what we see is that as PFC increases, amygdala decreases. But what we saw in kids with reading disorder is actually as amygdala increased, prefrontal cortex also increased. So rather than the typical inverse relationship that we expected, we saw a direct relationship. Um, and we thought that maybe that meant that kids with reading disorder had ineffective regulation of their anxiety. So we wanted to test why do we think that this is happening. So we tried a mediation model. And we took into account the resting state functional connectivity between the amygdala and prefrontal cortex, the anxiety scores, and the reading fluency scores. We dumped them all into the model. And what we found was that anxiety, in fact, mediated the relationship between the amygdala PFC connectivity and reading impairment. Um, so what that told us was Anxiety and reading deficits, deficits have a shared biological mechanism. So since the functional connectivity between amygdala and PFC was associated with both anxiety and reading, we thought that anxiety was contributing to or even exacerbating, exacerbating the reading difficulties that the kids had. And it's really important to note that this model was true across the entire sample. So this was not a reading disorder specific issue. This was seen also in typically developing kids. So now that we know that there is actually a neurobiological link between anxiety and reading, and I don't know, we didn't test other aspects of learning or academic skills, but I wonder if there's a similar feedback loop between anxiety and other areas of study. Um, what do you guys do? Um, so it seems like reading is a slow, effortful, and anxiety-provoking experience, even for some kids without reading disorder because of amygdala PFC connectivity kind of screwing up both processes. I think that means, for all of you guys, that you really do need to address your symptoms of anxiety when you're trying to improve reading or when you're trying to study in general. Um, I think that there's three major things that we need to talk about. The first is self-care. So I thought today that there were snacks outside. I think that's great. You need to watch what you're eating. You need to watch your sleep. 
You need to take breaks. Give yourself some time off. Exercise. Do things you enjoy. I hear laughter. <laughs> um, I don't know if that means that you're doing self-care and sleeping here. <laughs> or if you really just don't. I mean, I work with high schoolers who are having trouble in school, and I know that sometimes taking care of themselves is like the bottom of their priority list. They just don't have time to do it. Um, or their parents are putting so much pressure on them, or their teachers are putting so much pressure on them to study, 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 but really that's not the most effective way to approach it. You do need to take time for yourself to do things you enjoy and to give yourself a break. Um, there's a branch of clinical psychology called cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and they, cognitive behavioral therapists teach a lot of coping skills. Um, some of them are visualizing being somewhere relaxing like the beach slide I showed earlier. You can take deep breaths. You can tense and then relax your body to chill out your muscles. But there's a lot of coping strategies that you can learn to decrease your anxiety when you have a lot of work to do. Another thing that I actually think is most helpful that is also re really easy to ignore when you have a lot going on is to use effective time management and make sure that you study over many days. Because that sort of space studying and rehearsal and repetition really gives you more exposure to the material that's making you stressed out. And as you become more exposed and more familiar, your anxiety will decrease. And with that, I always think it's a really good idea that when a test taking experience is really stressful for you to try to mimic that experience in your studying. So if it's going to be a multiple choice test, quiz yourself in a multiple choice format. So again, you're exposed to that sort of experience. And when you get there, it's not so stressful and emotionally arousing. Um, OK, so let's chat. Any questions? Should I pass around the mic? Yeah, we'll take care of it. OK. <laughs> Swag after a oh, little Doug, what, what's our we're getting it? Okay, swag is coming. We'll try to pay attention. Okay, so let's go with the first question over here. Um, hi, I have a few questions actually. Uh -huh. My first one being, what is your motivation for researching this? Um, to tell you the truth, and I, there's a few things that kind of, my interests were shaped by a few different things. The first is that I've always really liked working with kids. Um, originally I thought I would be a pediatrician, then I thought I would be a teacher, but I kind of stumbled upon psychology and I really like the one-on-one -on -one relational experience of being with people, um, so that's why I became a psychologist. Um, in terms of the learning stuff, I was like really blessed to have enjoyed school for my entire life. Um, and I feel like I'm in a position where I can help other people also enjoy school. It's like the worst thing in the world, I think, to hate school. You guys are stuck there all day, every day, five days a week for 18 years of your life. Like if it's a drag, that's the kind of thing. So um, I really want to help other people realize that the joy in learning and the relevance to life and have it not be such an arduous process. So that's why I have been working with learning disabilities and studying them as well. Uh, another question? Mm -hmm. Another question is, what are some misconceptions people might have about this research? Oh boy. Um, we were just talking about this earlier, um, before I started the talk. I sort of hate to say this, but it's something that I think everybody should know, students and teachers and parents. And the field of neuroscience is relatively new, and the brain is a really, really, really complex, complex organ. And there's so much we don't know. Um, even within just the tiny field of fMRI research, the methodologies that we're using are constantly getting refined, and we're finding out that things that we thought were true are, in fact, not true at all. Like, I think that the best way to describe the experience of being a scientist is that, for me at least, the more I learn, the less I think I know. Um, so in terms of where the field is right now to make such a clear link to education, like I know that neuroscience is really hot in education right now and we all 
want to incorporate neuroscientifically based techniques into classrooms and everything. I don't know if we're ready to do that yet, to be honest. Um, so a big misconception is that we know how to take our knowledge of the brain and to apply it to school. We don't yet. What are next steps to your research? Will you still continue on anxiety or on learning, um, learning how to improve learning? So my research has actually taken quite a turn. Um, now I'm doing adult intervention research um, on people that have more significant disabilities than the ones I studied when I was at Columbia. So now I'm studying young adults who have autism and related disorders, and I'm trying to figure out um, what interventions work best for those sorts of populations. Um, so I would say yes, now I am studying learning, but learning at, I guess, a different level than I was previously. All right, I'm gonna come back here without bumping into this camera. There we go. Hi, um, I was wondering, did you assign like a specific point value or like, how did you measure anxiety specifically? Good question. Um, which, I don't remember what scale we use, to be honest. But there's a bunch of rating scales mm -hmm. that exist in the field of psychology. And what happens is you fill out a questionnaire. All of the questions that you answered are each scored on, as you said, a point value. And then all the tests are normed. So let me explain to you what that means. Before a test is published, the testing company tries out that test on thousands of people and they measure what's the average score when thousands and thousands of people take this test, and then what's the distribution of those scores so we could figure out what's the average and then what's the variability. And each score is then assigned a percentile and a standard score um, so you can see how different you are from the average. Um, so that's what happened with these anxiety measures. So you fill out the score and then we measure your score against the norm sample of people your age. So if you're 18 years old, we see in the norm population, in the sample that the test was tested on, how did 18 year olds respond and where do you fall in relation to those people? Thank you. All right, hands up. Who wants to ask another question? I'm gonna, you, you have um, it on Alice. All right, so, okay, what exactly happens when the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex don't work together? It, could that be one of the causes of, like, learning disorders? That's a really great question, um, and I think I would have to do a whole bunch more research to definitively tell you the answer to your question. But I can tell you what I think, based on my clinical work and what I've read. I don't know if anxiety causes learning disorders. A lot of people actually think the reverse. So I think that more people that I work with think that they're so anxious because they're not doing well in school. Alternatively, people might say you're so anxious that you're not paying attention in class, so you're not learning as well. You're so focused on your own emotions that you're not available to learn the information. So maybe one's causing the other, maybe it's the opposite. I actually think that learning difficulties and anxiety are kind of part of the same disorder. So I think anxiety is actually a crucial piece of a learning disorder rather than a cause of a learning disorder. Um, and I think that this amygdala PFC connectivity issue is part of a more general self-regulation issue that is faced by people with learning disorders. So kind of both. Does that answer the question all? Yeah. Okay, but again, I'm not sure. Like, I haven't pro I haven't proven that. I don't. I don't think anybody else has either. All right, I'm coming over here. Uh, all right. Let's see. Here you go. So during your research, I have two questions. How long did your research last? I was on fellowship for three years. The study was going on for probably five years before I got there, and it's still going on now. 
So this is a long, ongoing study. A lot of fMRI research takes a lot of time. Between It takes a long time to recruit a sample, to get them all tested. There's always funding issues that are in the mix that we need to deal with. I mean, studies take a very, very long time. This particular paper, I started, I started doing the data analysis in the summer of 2016, and the paper was published in the fall of this year. So that was my part. Um, another question. Is there any like limitations that you saw while you were doing the research that you wish that the future generation could solve? Um, yeah, the most important one is it's really hard to scan kids. You guys move a lot. Um, so there are a lot of things that we can do mathematically to control for motion in the scanner. If you move, it's going to kind of throw off the image. So, what, so people way smarter than I am have kind of figured out statistical techniques to deal with that activity so that we could kind of screen out what's fake and what's at, what are we actually looking at. Um, but that needs to be really refined. So if anybody is really good at neurophysics and statistics and wants to take on how to better do neuroimaging with kids and other populations that are difficult to study, that's an area of research that's wide open. I have a question. Um, so in high school you said you were interested in chemistry and physics. Yeah. Um, so how did you make the shift from that to psychology? Um, they're not as unrelated as you would think. Um, chemistry is huge in the field of psychology. Chemistry is also huge in the field of psychiatry and psychopharmacology and medications and treatments and neurotransmitters, um, all of that stuff. And physics is huge in neuroimaging and scanning techniques. So I don't think I was really so far afield. Um, I know that sometimes when you're learning the basics of a field, it's, you sort of think, how am I going to possibly use this in my life? But if it's interesting and you pursue it further, you can see how it funnels down into a tiny, tiny little part of that field that you think is fascinating. And you could really delve into that little tiny corner. And I think that that's kind of what I did. All right, let's see. I saw your hand first. All right. um, my question deals more with uh, what you mentioned earlier in the session. Um, you were speaking about statistics, and you mentioned how to determine um, the mediator, if I'm getting the word correctly, between um, of, of the relationship between two factors. Um, I would uh, appreciate it if you would be able to go over that one more time. Please. Sure. Some people are better statisticians than I am. To tell you the truth, I wasn't sure, in this case, how the variables all related to one another. And I worked with a professional statistician, and this is all that this woman does, is come up with statistical models that are the best fit for a data set. Um, I went into the study with a hypothesis that can I go back to that slide? Do you mind? There's two things you could do. You could have hypothesis-driven research. You could say, I think that this is what's going on, and test it and see if you're right. That's what I did, and I got really lucky that it worked. I actually did think that the anxiety was the mediator. The other thing you could do is just dump everything in and go on what people call a fishing expedition. That's not the best way to do it, but you could kind of dump things into a model and see if your model works. If it doesn't work, try a different one. Um, this is the one that fits best, and I was happy with it, because I'm not sure I would be able to make a conclusion in about any other sequence. Initially, what came back, I thought, was that the resting state functional connectivity was the mediator, and I was like, I have no clue what that means from like a practical, real-life standpoint. Um, 
So this is sort of what I thought was going on, and it fit. Um, but I wasn't the one to figure it out. I had a sad vision for that. Um. So my question is, like, what makes, um, what was something that was, like, really complex or, like, any difficulties you faced during your research? Oh, everything was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's I was in a clinical psychology program. I didn't learn neuroimaging as a graduate student. I learned everything that I needed to know on fellowship. Um, and that was huge. I needed to learn about the theory behind fMRI, and then I needed to learn the computer programs, and I needed to learn how to code script to analyze these crazy data sets. Um, so I knew the psychology, I kind of knew from a clinical standpoint how I thought people learned, but in terms of the logistics and the skills I needed to develop to test my hypotheses, that was a huge learning curve. Um, and there's still so much, I mean, I spent two years like reading manuals and practicing and trying things out and there's still so, so much. I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. There's so much to know. Okay, over here. Hi, uh, what's, was the brain activity able to let you know if they were claustrophobic in the MRI machine? No, but their screams to come out. We didn't try to question. We didn't screen that out because it's like impossible to have claustrophobic people in that MRI. Alright, we didn't even test that. <laughs> uh, what was your first research? Oh, like like real research? Yeah. I mean, I did a senior thesis in college, but I, I'm not going to count that. Um, my first real research is I was involved in a public health study when I was a graduate student on reproductive health counseling at school-based health clinics, which was fascinating. I learned about pregnancy prevention and what are school nurses doing, and if hospitals have clinics in schools, what are they doing, and what are the barriers to getting effective contraception methods to teenagers. Um, and I love that stuff. I just didn't have an opportunity to pursue it after. But actually my dissertation for my graduate degree was on that information. Uh, question down here. As someone who's a high school student and battles with anxiety, I was wondering what um, your opinion is as a psychologist um, would be like for dealing with that. I'm going to ask you to hold your question until the activity next. Okay. Um, we're going to do a little group therapy session and we'll go over some strategies that you could use. Um, but if anxiety is really a problem in your life, I highly recommend being a therapist. Um, and this is not something to laugh about. I know that there's some stigma about seeking mental health care. I think. Everyone should be in therapy. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a therapist, so I obviously believe this, but I think that everyone has stress in their lives, and we're all sort of handling the stress as best we can. But there's always ways to do it better, and there's no shame in getting help to figure out those better ways to handle whatever it is that you're facing. It's all real, um, and we all need support. So if you are really experiencing issues with mood or anxiety or anything else, seek out help. Okay, I have a question right here. Um, you moved from studying children with reading disorders to young adults with autism. Do you see yourself branching off again in the future in your, into other areas of research? I hope not, because that means I lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows? You know, it's interesting. Part of being a scientist isn't just studying whatever it is that you're interested in, you're also kind of bound to what is the world interested in and what sorts of research is being funded and where is the world moving? Where are the questions that you're equipped to answer? Um, I think that's just the reality of the field. Um, so 
so I was able to find a position that was funded, that I was able to pursue questions that I was interested in, that I felt confident in answering. And I'm discovering a whole new world of study that I honestly didn't, if I was on fellowship, I actually wasn't really thinking much about adults that had developmental, dis developmental disabilities. But now that I'm more in that world, I mean, I think it's totally fascinating. Um, and it's really rich for study, and there are people that really need the information and need the help. So. Uh, question. Um, hi, I was wondering what kind of reading disorder you studied. Was it just a general one, or was it dyslexia, or a whole bunch of different types? You know so much about reading disorder. I'm so impressed. Most people I speak to think that reading disorder and dyslexia are the exact same thing, but you seem to know more. So, <laughs> to explain to everybody else, um, reading disorder is difficulty reading. You don't read as well as you should, given your age, given your educational exposure, given the instruction that was provided to you. Um, but it doesn't explain why. It's just a label to describe people that are not reading as well as we think they should be. Dyslexia is a specific deficit in something that's called phonological processing. And that's a really specific skill that means that you can hear a sound and you could match that sound to a letter. You could make the correspondence between a sound and the symbol that matches up with that sound. And you could discriminate between sounds and you could manipulate sounds and move them around and say a word but delete one syllable from that sound, I mean from that word. So if you have difficulty manipulating sounds and matching them to the symbols that describe them, it's going to be very difficult to read. That's dyslexia. You might also just have a general language comprehension issue. So you could decode words, you could physically, you could read the word itself just fine, but then making meaning of that word is difficult, and you'll have a reading disorder, but you won't have dyslexia. Um, so those are two, or you could have both. You could have a comprehension issue and dyslexia. Um, this was a mixed bag. So we had some dyslexics, we had some non-dyslexics, we had some double dyslexics, you know, we had some with both. Um, so we didn't isolate the subject. But good question. All right, I'll come down here because you're sitting in the front. Um, what other topics besides anxiety would you be interested in researching in the future? I love math. Um, I actually, when I went on fellowship, I really wanted to study math. The problem with, with math is that we don't know anything about it. Reading research is way far ahead of math research. So, who was the person that asked me, what else is there to study? Math is like the Wild West. So if anybody wants to study neurobiological processes underlying math, go right ahead. <laughs> I have a question up here. Uh, have any of your studies shown a correlation between dopamine levels and the amount of anxiety someone faces? I didn't study neurotransmitters at all, so no. <laughs> Good question, though. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's actually, people that do psychiatry research and do like medication trials do more work with neurotransmitters than just plain old neuroimagers. Um, so if you want a place to start reading, psychiatry journals would be a good place to start. Okay, over here. Hi, two, two quick things. Uh, the first being when, there, when you found that there was an inverse relationship between the connectivity between the PFC and the amygdala, what triggered activity in each state? That's the first. The second one is, in your like expert opinion, what would you say uh, the, the activity would be like in the amygdala if there was little to no activity in the PFC? Um, I didn't make the discovery of the inverse relationship between PFC and amygdala. That was, there are tons of other studies that found that before I even got here. Um, I did replicate that finding though. So I saw that in my like low anxiety, no reading issue part of the sample, they did show the typical pattern of the inverse connectivity. In terms of what causes that inverse pattern, remember that this is resting state. So all they were doing is they were lying in the scanner. They weren't doing anything. They weren't doing a particular task. So actually, I don't know 
what caused it in these kids. It's just, that's just kind of, when your brain is left to its own devices, how do these regions interact? And that's what we see. Um, there were no PFC. So if somebody basically had no frontal lobe, they would have really major difficulties self-regulating in many aspects of life, including emotion. So they just might be very emotionally labile. So what that means is that they'd have really high highs and really low lows and switch from one mood to another very quickly, um, be really easily overcome by their emotions. Um, and you see that in teenage samples. So. <laughs> um, I think we should take just a couple more questions, but quickly, I, I wanted to ask if, um, when we, did you, would you prefer to stay in here because of how many people, or do you think it's better to go out there? Um, I mean, I think it would be cool if everybody, like, kind of split into groups. Do you guys think you could do that here? Like, just speak with the people around you, or would it be easier to go to tables? Tables? Okay. So just as an FYI. Wait, not yet. Not, not yet. yet. We're going to take a couple more questions in here. I just was trying to plan ahead. Um, we're, after the Q&A, we'll sit at the tables outside where we, where we met. But let's take two more, two more questions. So, Adelis, if you want to grab someone. Right. Or raise your hands if you have questions. Oh, by the way, guys, I mean, I don't know if you're asking a question because you really want to, or you're getting extra credit for asking a question, but regardless, if you have a question that I don't have time to answer today, just come find me. I'm happy to give you my email if you want to follow up and ask me a question. Now, I'm totally happy to continue this conversation after today, so feel free. Thank you. Okay, so we have a, oh, me. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Here we are. All right, let's settle down for a second. Let's make sure we get enough time for questions. Yeah. <laughs> So how come you decided to choose um, for your discovery, like your testing to use an SMR instead of an EEG? The study was an fMRI. I was part of an fMRI lab. They weren't doing EEG work at all. Interestingly, at Hopkins, they're where I am now, they're doing a ton of EEG research, so I'm just starting to learn that. Um, and that's really exciting, because I think that that's, if you don't know what EEG is, <clears throat> They put electrodes on your scalp. You may have seen a picture with people that look like they have dots all over their heads. They have like a net with little circles everywhere. And it measures electrical activity at your scalp. So it's another way of quantifying brain activity. Um, and I'm just beginning to learn that. So I just, that wasn't what the lab was doing, I tell you. Any last? Last question. All right, we have one more. Last question. Here you go, you get the honors. It might be a discussion of a confounding variable, but I was wondering with respect to um, your uh, test subjects, were the ones with the reading disorder, were they screened for some sort of like visual issue, like uh, because that could uh, contribute to a reading problem? Right, so that was part of the comprehensive neuropsych battery. So we gave them academic testing, but in addition, they were there for hours. I mean, they had an IQ test. They had attention testing, executive functioning testing, testing for psychopathology. So actually it's important to know that none of the kids actually had a full-blown anxiety disorder. They kind of had what we call subclinical anxiety. So they had higher than normal levels of anxiety, but I wouldn't say that they had a diagnosis of anxiety. Um, so we screened out depression, we screened out ADHD, um, we tested, we made sure that they had a recent vision and hearing test. Um, so we tried to deal with as many of those confounding variables that we could possibly think of. Okay, great. So before you guys get up, please make sure that you are taking your garbage with you. The custodial, uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. The custodial staff here are our friends and we'd like to keep it that way. We love them. Secondly, um, grab all of your stuff Try to find a seat at one of the circle tables. Oh, and hello, can we get a thank you, please? Um, round of applause.
Because Matthew likes band, I like science.